we started looking at uh, a topic cultured by the grace of God. And uh, we say that uh, the grace of God, because now we are living in the dispensation of the grace of God, that the grace of God has an expectation. Amen? And uh, the purpose, why does God want us to be cultured by his grace? Why does he want us to be cultured by his grace? Is so that we can be able to reflect Christ and do the will of God here on the earth. Amen. So God desires for us to be cultured by the grace of God. And when I'm talking about the grace of God, I am talking about, about the word of his grace. That is what is called the word of his grace. Amen. Because when you're talking about culture, culture is passed from one generation to another through words. Amen. It is uh, passed down from one generation to another generation through words and through action, the things that they do, the things that they copy that were present in the previous generation. So culture, very important, is communicated from one generation to another through words. That's where they sit down and they tell people, this is how we do it. Amen. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Maybe in, for an example, you, you find that different cultures, different tribes have different kind of cultures. Amen. Have you ever gone to, to a, uh, a different uh, tribe and you were shocked by their culture? You know, being a pastor, I've gone to different places. You know, there are places I've gone, I'm like, wow, this is so different. Amen. And then the person had to explain to me, pastor, this is how we do it in our culture. This is how we do it in our culture because it's so different from, from where I am coming from. Amen. There is nothing wrong. It's only that the cultures are different. So, but those people, just like our people, whatever they are doing right now, they did not start doing it now. It is something that has always been there, but it's something that has been communicated from one generation to another through words. As they see other people do, one generation moves and they, con they continue to do things as they have ha seen other people do in the other generation. So in a nutshell, when you're talking about a culture, we are talking about a way of life. Tell your neighbor a way of life. The desire of God is, is that you, the word of his grace is going to culture you so much. That the word of his grace is going to cultivate your life so much. That when people look at you, you look like the word of his grace. Amen. Because just the same way someone can look at you and be like, hey, you are behaving like. Are you getting me? You are behaving like. You are behaving like. Why? Because there is there's an aspect of your life that we look at that we can liken to something. So the desire of God is that the same way that we have our cultures, where we are coming from, our traditions, that God is going to culture us, that he's going to culture us, the word of his grace is going to culture us, that we, we just become an expression of the word of his grace. But God knows and understands just, just the same way culture does not happen in a day. Cult, being cultured by the word of God does not happen in a month. Being cultured by the word of God does not happen in a week. It happens over a period of time. So you cannot do something one day and say, this is our culture. You cannot do something today and then you define that as culture. Culture is something that has happened over time in a, in a, in a place or in a people and now it has become their way of life. Amen? So God desires the, the, the grace of God to be a way of life that when people look at you, they don't even need to be asked whether the, you know the grace of God. They don't need to be asked whether you know the gospel of Jesus Christ because everywhere you go, you become the fragrance of Christ. Amen. Everywhere you go, you are just like Jesus everywhere you go. And last week, for those who are not there, I gave a, a legit example. Amen. A legit example that we, have, we, we as Kenyans, we have been influenced by a culture, okay? And if you remember, I said there are people that came, okay? And they brought with them their culture. And now most of us, the kind of language we are speaking, even the language that I am speaking to you right now, is a proof that we allowed another culture to come and become our culture. Because initially, this is not my first language. Amen? 
But right now, if I begin to speak in my first language, some of you will think I'm, a, I'm not educated. Some of you will begin to judge me. There's are going to be a bias. Amen. You're going to say she didn't go to school. Why? Because they told us for somebody to prove that they have gone to school, there's a language that you have to speak. So we embraced it and we bought it and we believed it. Yeah, that you have to speak English as proof that you actually entered a classroom. Amen? So they brought with them their culture. And let me tell you, people, you have, somebody has not cultured you enough if they have not influenced. Amen? They influence. Culture is about influence. Amen? Culture is about influence. If they have not influenced how you think, if they have not influenced how you talk, if they have not influenced how you dress, they have not cultured you enough. Amen. So they came and influenced us with their culture and we bought into it. That's why we dress the way we dress. That is why we drive right because where they came from, you drive right. They came and told us when you go on the road, you don't do left. You stay on the, you stay on the right. So we bought so much from them. And I'm saying this so that to give you a real example. Amen. A real example of what culture can do to somebody. Because this is not how we were always. But we bought ourselves. We got a, another culture. People of another culture came and influenced us with their culture. And I said when I started that God desires to influence us with the word of his grace. So that the grace of God becomes our culture. Amen. So to speak that it becomes our way of life. And because the devil understands culture, he understands culture, we find that in the book of Genesis, there is something that the devil introduced into man. There is something the devil introduced into man. And when the Adam and Eve sinned, he introduced fear in man. Amen. He introduced fear in man because the devil wanted to grow a culture in man. And without, without fear, there is no way he would have been able to grow this culture in man where he would have dominion over the thought life and over how men behave. So he introduced fear. And of course, when you're talking about fear, it also comes with selfishness. I said last Sunday that when you see people becoming so greedy and they are taking what they don't even need, is because within them is this nature that was introduced in the Garden of Eden, and this is a nature of fear. Amen? And nature and the nature of fear is accompanied with selfishness. So when you see somebody that is selfish, they cannot share whatever they have with anybody whatever they, they actually have enough and they want more they are under an influence amen they are under an influence and that is the influence of fear so they become so selfish and with time they even become so greedy they just want to take everything that they, there is because they are not sure about tomorrow in fear, there is insecurity. You are not sure about tomorrow. So they are taking as much as they can today because they are not sure whether they are going to have enough for tomorrow. Why? Because within them, there is a, there is a culture. There is something that has been developed within them. To them, there is a, they are outliving something that has become a reality on their inside. And that is why we find there is so much greed on the face of the earth. Why? That has its basis, has its gender. Genesis in the fear that was introduced into man in the book of Genesis. We say that uh, when you go to the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 1 to verse 13, it is, I'm not going to read it, but it is a story of, uh, of the virgins and how the, the, the bridegroom is going to come at a time that they, are, they will not know. But here we find that the, the virgins, the issue was not whether they were virgins, and we are talking about virgins, we are talking about purity, amen? We are talking about people that have not been defiled. We are talking about people who are undefiled. And this also is a type of the church of Jesus Christ, amen? Because they are virgins. They have, been re they, they have been recreated in Christ Jesus. But the Bible says that as much as they were virgins, there is something that they forgot to do. That when the time when the, the bridegroom came, there are those who did, not who did not carry extra oil. They had it initially. Amen. 
They were saved. They had the oil. Praise the name of Jesus. But when the bridegroom de delayed, they were like, I, I, is he really coming? You know, I've been saved for five years. I've been saved for 10 years. I have been saved for 30 years. They've just been telling us that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I mean, since I was born, I was in primary school. They have just been telling us Jesus is coming. So because of that, they, they entered a mode of relaxation. Amen. Were they virgins? Yes. But what did they not do? They did not carry extra oil, meaning they did not continue in the mode that they began. Amen. So I'm not talking about physical oil. I am talking how you keep yourself alert in the spirit. How you keep yourself alert in the spirit so that by the time that rapture is happening, you are going to be ready to be taken together with the rest of the church. So the issue was not whether they were virgins. The issue is they did not have extra oil. Praise the name of Jesus. And what, the, the, what is happening in our generation right now, it is, a, it is a un, un, unraveling, you know. It is the unfolding of this scripture. Many people now have entered a, a, a mode of relaxation. They are like, uh-uh, we've just been told that Jesus is coming. But let me tell you, you don't have to believe it. Rapture is going to happen. You don't even have to pray for it. This is not a prayer request. They don't put this on your prayer list. You don't have to pray for it, you know. Just you don't like have to pray for those to be clouds. Whether you pray or you don't, those are called clouds. So those, thi those things are outside, those white things, they are called clouds, amen. And we did not pray them into being. The same way is how rapture is going to happen. Rapture is not going to happen because of much prayer, no. Rapture will happen because that will be God's appointed time. And when that God appointed time comes, those who will be ready are the ones who are going to go. Praise the name of Jesus. And my prayer is that you are going to still have your oil with you. Hallelujah. You are still going to be oiled up by the time that is happening. Because the scripture is talking about something that is futuristic. It's not something that has happened. The Bible is talking about when he is coming. So it is something that has not happened as yet. So there are many people now that have just uh, been there and they're like, you know what? I don't have to go to church. I don't have to be under a pastor. I don't have to be accountable to anyone. What you don't know is that you're affecting your oil. Amen. Because when you make, meet together with the brethren, when you come for a prayer meeting, you know, you're vitalizing yourself. Amen. You're keeping yourself alert. You're keeping yourself fresh. Even as you, the, the leader comes and tells you, let's speak in other tongues. You know, you're building yourself up in your whole most holy faith as you continue to be to speak in tongues. When you come to the house of God and you are taught with the word of God, there is a freshness that you continue to, re, to that you continue to maintain in your life. And there are things that the devil might want to tempt you with that you're not going to be able to tempt you with because there's a freshness. There is an alertness that, you, that is always within you. There's a consciousness that is maintained within you. Why? Because you have not neglected the, the gathering together of the brethren. I don't know why many people think they're smarter than God. If Jesus is there, if the word of God says, do not neglect the gathering together of the brethren, it means not gathering on Facebook. It is not gathering on YouTube. It is not gathering on social media. Uh -uh. You want to tell me by the time that this was going to be written, that the Holy Spirit did not know there was going to be social media? He knew there was going to be social media. Amen? But now, even with the social media, he said, do not despise the gathering together of the brethren. So many people, we entered into COVID, and during COVID, we had to watch online because of the lie that was moving around. But even after the lie left, now people are like, hiya, come back and watch on TV. Ah, there is no, there is, you cannot serve God on TV. Can you usher from your sitting room? Can you usher from your sitting room? Can you lead us in praise and worship in your sitting room? No, can you pray together with us in your sitting room? You cannot do to that. And what the people don't know is that the devil is the one at work. He is telling you, you don't have to go to church. See, 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 you know, you have Wi-Fi. You can be able to watch pastor on TV. And whatever they are receiving in church is what they are going to receive at home. But let me tell you, it is totally different. Sitting in church and sitting in your sitting room, those are two different realities. It is like watching news. Yes, 
It is like watching news. So let no one lie to you that, oh my God, I am so tired. I don't think I feel I want to go to church. And because God has blessed me, let me switch on some Wi-Fi and let, let me watch church. Church was never meant to be watched on YouTube. According to the wisdom of God, the creator of heaven and earth, people were meant to gather together. So that you can fellowship with your sister. So that you can encourage somebody verbally. You can encourage somebody with your physical presence. So that when you come to church and somebody sees you praying, knowing what they are going th you are going through, they are like, hey, if my sister is going through that she, and she's praying, what about the little thing that I'm going through? Even me, I'm praying. So we get together so that we can give us godly warmth. So let no one, let no one lie to you that you don't need to come to church. Because they are saying they are smarter than God himself. And you can never be smarter than God. Because the Bible says that before the rapture happens, there's going to be a great falling away. This is a very sad, hey, it is sad. Because you don't fall if you are not standing. You fall if you are standing. And the Bible says that there's going to be a great, not a small, a great falling away. And the Bible, let me just read this one. Let no one deceive, I'm saying this for the sake of those who are not there last week. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way that for that day will not come except the apostasy comes first. Unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed, who, those who have professed to be Christians has come. So the falling is for those who have professed to be Christians. And the man of lawlessness seen is revealed who is a son of perdition. Praise the name of Jesus. So it is very important that this is a time where the Bible says that you work out your salvation with fear and you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because this thing is so personal. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just about you and yourself. So it's, this is a time that we really have to be alert because if there is a time that the devil is against the church of Jesus Christ is now. You know, in our parents' days in the 1950s, there was no social media. So right now you go on Facebook, they're against the church. You go to wherever, they're against the church. I mean the church is being attacked from every corner. So if you do not work out, your, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, my prayer is I pray that you shall not be among those that shall fall away. Because it is such a you, you'd be, it will be such a disadvantage on you that having served God for 20 years having not gone to the clubs having not doing other, what other people were doing, that you'll be considered as those that has fallen away. Just hold your heart and begin to just pray for yourself for a minute. Tell God, I'm not among those that will fall away. Or, or declare in the name of Jesus that, Lord, I shall stand. No matter the persecution, no matter what, God, I am going to stand. I'm not going to be among that, those that will fall away. I'm not going to be among those that have professed Christ but will fall away in the name of Jesus Christ. Just declare that, my God, my heart shall remain steadfast. My calm, I shall remain alert in my spirit in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. We are talking about being cultured by the word of God. You see these ones that fell off, these ones that fell off, the ones that fell off, they are those who were not cultured by grace because you can never be cultured by grace and you fall. Ah, uh -uh. You cannot because culturing takes time. Praise the name of Jesus. It takes time. It takes consistency. You cannot be that person that has exposed themselves to the word of God consistently, that has, uh, has been praying, reading the word of God, and you'll be among those that will fall away. The ones that will fall away are those who come to church because the others are coming to church. Praise God. You know, are the, those who, who read the scripture as it is being put here. They never get time to sit down and study the word for themselves. They never have their own personal prayer life. The only time they pray is 
is on Friday in the evening. They don't have a personal prayer life. They don't have a personal uh, Bible time where they sit down there like, you know what? I studied for, I studied to get myself a job. <laughs> now, let me tell you, church, you better study to get yourself an eternity. Know that you are not in it. Amen. Yeah, because those who are in Christ are already in eternity. Are you understanding? But for us to be sure that when that day happens, that, that none, of, none of us will be left behind. Praise the name of Jesus. None of us shall be left behind, but we shall be consistent because we're going to be consistent. Those are the ones when they are corrected by the words of God, by the word of God, they say, don't condemn me. Hey, there's no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. They don't want to be corrected. The fact that they are they got born again, they are, they, are, they are fine with it. They don't want anything beyond that. I am born again. So they don't know, they are not able to differentiate and they're going to look at it. The things that are of God and the things that are not of the things that are of God and the things that are not of God. Praise the name of Jesus. So very, very important. I, I want us to go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. We are talking about being cultured by the grace of God, allowing the grace of God to cultivate us until we have a way of life that is called the grace of God. The Bible says, this Paul speaking, he said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Amen. So when Paul is talking, when Paul is telling us here, I mean, he doesn't have a reason to tell us what happened in his life when he was four years. He's not telling us what happened in his life when he was seven years. No. This thing, spiritual, spiritual uh, maturity, he's not talking about his physical maturity. I'm not talking about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. No. I am talking about spiritual progress. Are you understanding? So Paul, in other words, he's acknowledging. He is the apostle of grace. But he's saying, even me as Paul. By the time that Jesus appeared to me, you know the difference between us and Paul is that you, you come to the front and you say, Jesus, come into my heart. Isn't it? But for Paul, it was an encounter. But the fact remains, salvation is salvation. Isn't it? Whether you are visited by an angel or you come to church or you got saved at a crusade or you got saved by yourself, salvation is salvation. And we all begin in the same place. That is why you find that even Paul, after he, he, he had an encounter with the Lord, he did not begin to preach immediately. The Bible says he went to Arabia. Because there is no way God, as much as he had that kind of an encounter, God would not, not have entrusted him with the gospel immediately. He, no, 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 because he was a spiritual baby. You don't, uh, you don't, there are things you don't give to spiritual babies to take care of because they wouldn't know what to do with it. So Paul went to Arabia for years and he stayed there because by the time he was going there, he had not matured to a place where now he would get to a place where he can be able to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ, how God would have desired him to communicate. So Paul is saying, I am the apostle of grace, but me, the apostle of grace, there was a time I was a spiritual baby. After I encountered Jesus, I did not mature the following day. I, 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 even me, Paul, it was a process. Even me, Paul, it is a place that I got to. So he's saying when he was a child, he spoke as a child. He understood as a child. I mean, meaning that the filters of his understanding were childish. The filters, how he was able to process information was childish. He was not processing information as somebody that is mature. Praise God. So he said when he was a child, he thought as a child. But the Bible says he did not end up, he did not remain as a child. The Bible says, but when I became a man, there is a time he became a man. But do you know this progress? The guy maybe was in his 40s. By the time he was a child and by the time he was a man, we are talking about a time when the man had a beard. Praise the name of Jesus. So he's telling us that there are things that when we speak, they are childish. So when you're talking about a child, I looked it in the Greek. Hello, Praise the name of Jesus. <laughs> 
In the Greek, the word, the, the, the word child here is nepios. Tell your neighbor nepios. Yes, the peers. And when, when you're talking about a full grown man, the Bible that the, in the Greece is called huios. Amen. So when Paul is saying that when I was an appeals, okay, when I was an appeals, I spoke as one. I spoke as an appeals. I understood as an appeals. And I thought as an appeals. But when I became a huios, amen. Praise the name of Jesus. He put away the things that Nepi, the, the things that Nepios do. Amen. So when you get to church and you, you don't want to come to church. Why? Because last time you last week you came to church and the ushers did not usher you well. Tell your neighbor Nepios. Oh, I, 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 I don't like that church because I, I, I went to the bathroom and the bathrooms were not very clean. Somebody said Nepios. Because if you were heels, you'd have taken the mop and brought a solution. That is what heels do. But Nepios, they keep on complaining. Do your children complain until sometimes you feel like I want to lend you to somebody else? You, you feel like you want to lend your children, you know. You want to lend your children because of the nepiousness that they are manifesting in your home. So, even this, I'm saying this to say, Paul, when he was saying that he was a child, he was a full-grown man. But he was saying there are things that he thought. There are things that he did that were, according to God, childish. I don't go to that church anymore. You know, there is this sister that I had issues with the department. And because I had issues with this sister in that department, I don't go to church anymore. Tell your neighbor, Nepios. Is that, that, that the person in the department, how are they connected with your journey in the Lord? Did you come to church to be liked by everyone? Did you come to church to be loved by everyone? Did you know everyone before you came to JCC Thicker Road? Then how come somebody you met in JCC Thicker Road becomes the reason as to why you don't come to church? Somebody say Nepios. Yes, that is very Nepios. I don't, I don't, I don't serve God because you went for this mission. They were supposed to wait for me at the bus station and they all left me. So I had to go by myself. Nepios. They did not wait for me. You know, they were serving cake during the anniversary and I did not get a cake. Therefore, that church is not a church of excellence. I don't think I want to go back to that church. Somebody say, Nepios. Paul said, there is a way I process things, not like a man. Anybody that is walking in offense, that is Nepios. Because Jesus said, offense will definitely come. You don't pray for it. If offense will, how you deal with offense will show us, not you, will show us how nepios you are or how huios you are. At my, I was offended. What did you expect? How, what did you expect if you, and you are serving with other people in the department? You have your own opinion. If you are serving with 50 people in a department, those are 50 different opinions. You will be offended. But how you deal with the offense determines whether you are an appeals or you are a huios. So if you are working in bitterness, somebody say an appeals. Because huios, they forgive before they do it. Because you cannot allow anybody to affect your work with the Lord. So you say, you know, uh -uh, ha -ha, I'm not going to allow anybody to cause me to be so bitter that I cannot worship. But there are people who cannot worship because they are bitter. And even when they are telling you, they tell you, Pastor, I am very, very bitter. And it's like they are talking about something that you need to compliment. No, if you are a huios, if you are a person that has overcome, that has, you know, you don't just get to maturity in a day. 
You get into maturity because you have dealt with all the nepios things. And now you get to a place, now you become a chios. Amen. So if, if today, if today, you are still, if you are still proud because of your anger, nepios. You know that people say, me, huh? Me, I'm very, very, me, me. When I get angry, don't joke with me. Nepios. Because your anger does not satisfy the righteousness of God. It is not something to be proud about. It is not something to write home about. So please don't tell me where I come from. We are an angry people. Those people are on appeals. Even if they are born again, they are all. They have not allowed the word of God to grow them. So there are things that are so appeals. That you are not supposed to be talking about as a child of God. Not after you have been under the teaching of the grace of God. Because the grace of God is the help of God. Because if you have been so helped by God, how come you are still carrying bitterness for a year? If you are still helped by God, why are you still carrying anger? Nepios. Nepios. And we have so many nepios. Your, your father will come and sort you out next week. Let me just mess you out today. <laughs> Amen. Let me just mess up. Pastor Atakuja Kujenga. Praise the name of Jesus. But we have to stop being. You have to stop being the peers. That you may stop serving in that department. Why? Why didn't you stop? The, because the HOD rebuked me. Ne peers. What did you expect? You came, no, you came late. But the, the, the HOD was not supposed to ask you anything. Because way, you're an egg of, you're, you're an eggshell. Because if somebody steps on you, everybody will know you've been stepped on. Nepios. We need to get to a place where we allow the grace of God to culture us. That you can tell somebody straight to their face that my sister, it will take you so much. To make me angry. You can look at somebody and tell them, my brother, you have to work harder than that for me to be offended. You have to work harder than that for you, for me to become offended because the love of God is so resident in me. I am so saturated with the love of God that I don't have a place for offense. Now that is a huyos. And you get there after you have been cultivated, after you have been offended and discover that offense does not add value. After you have been bitter and discovered it only gives you ulcers and headaches. After you have been a place where you discover there is nothing good they are giving you, get to a place you are like, hey, Paul became. He was like, hey, this childish thing is now not working. And for me to serve God, I have to become a man. Because inheritance is meant for children but no responsible father will give an inheritance for it to be affected to a child those who manifest inheritance are those who are sons raise the name of jesus is something that he says that when he, he when he put when uh, when when he became a man, what did he do? He put away childish. He put away childish things. And how do you be, how do you put up childish things? He's not to say, oh, today I'm not gonna be angry. Uh -uh. Today I'm not gonna be offended. No. Today I'm not gonna be this. Today I'm not gonna be this. No. How you put away those childish things is when you focus on who you are in God. Because you can rebuke anger, and anger may not go. But if anger, the only way anger can go is when you tell anger, by the way, I carry the love of God. I am the righteousness of God. Within me, I have no space for anger because I carry the nature and the likeness of God. So that is how you do it. You, it, it does not go by you rebuking it. It goes by you becoming. Am you getting me? Anger does not go by you rebuking it. It goes by you becoming something else. Praise the name of Jesus. By you acknowledging who you are. Because in Christ you are not born angry. Hallelujah. In Christ Jesus you are not born angry. You are not born with bitterness. You are not born hey, with competition. Do you 
you know there is so much competition in the house of God? How many times have I dealt with people? Uh, they come and say, Pastor, this person was having a wedding. They came and took clothes from my shop. They have not paid. Pastor, no, me when I guess there, I was like, you know, there were so many until I was like, okay, guys, when you are borrowing from each other, Miss Kua, you know, <laughs> I was not, I was not there. But many people, many people right now in the church of Jesus Christ, there is so much competition. They don't know what the Bible says that it is good to be contented. Be contented where God has blessed you. God, the Bible says it is a great gain for you to be contented. But many people don't want to be contented because they are nepios. Do you know, you know children today, you buy for them chocolate? They go and see the neighbor with something else. They come. Remember you gave them chocolate. They come and say, Daddy, even, even, even Nani has. Daddy has. He has a sweet. I want a sweet. And the other hand, they're already holding chocolate. But now they want a sweet because they have seen somebody else with a sweet. It's a hard. Don't laugh because that's what's happening in the house of God. People are getting into debt. I mean, fellowships are being broken. Because people are borrowing money they cannot pay. Because they want to go and buy a dress. A dress. A dress. You borrow money. Money. To go and buy a dress. Nepios. <laughs> to borrow money. Know that your children are dying because of hunger. You're borrowing money to go and make your hair. The pios. I have never, and God knows, borrowed anybody money to buy an outfit. If it is on the level of mutush, I will mutush you until you want to know. I will, you know these things about taste, eh? You can be so rich but poor in taste. You, you, wear, you wear an outfit of 30,000 and there is nothing 30. But you can go to Kikosh and you buy a top of 500 and a skirt to match and you appear in Zion and people are like, wow. Because you are like, Lord, what I can work with right now is a thousand. And what makes this, what, what, the thing about this dress is not about the dress that makes it good. It's me that makes the dress look good. So God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress it. I'm going to clad it with confidence. You appear in church and people tell you, oh my God, my sister, you look so nice. You're like, oh, please don't ask me how much I got. In your heart, you're like, you better not ask me how much I got, I bought it for because I don't want to lie. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Because we have to be contented. You know, as a heos are contented people. You yeah, are so what you are driving, I am walking. The same God who blessed you is the same God who is going to do it for me. And I'm going to love you as you drive and as I walk. Now that is huyos. Huyos is somebody who is celebrating God in their house. You know, they are living in one bedroom, but they are celebrating. They are rejoicing in the Lord because they know the sense of their value is not the kind of a house they live in. Their value is anchored in Christ. Because there are many that live in big houses. But there is, there is no joy. There is no peace. You know, there is nothing that you, you, that, that you would write home about. But somebody who is matured in God. Somebody that has become a man. Somebody who, is, who has overcome the pious things. And they have become huyos. They can be living in a bed sitter. But the joy of the Lord coming from that person, the authority in the, of the name of Jesus coming from that person is because they know they all think things are temporal. They have focused on eternal things. This is not to say that God is not going to give you. He's going to give you. But why stress yourself? You see, if, okay, let's see how much your stress will speed up the the will speed up God to bring it your way. There are so many people who are stressed. Why are you stressed? 
Ha! Ah. And then you ask them, okay, did you come from the streets? No. So you came from a house? Oh, so you have a roof over your head? Yes. Okay, do you have a job? Yes, but... You know, they are receiving, they are getting 100,000, but they think it's too little. Because to them, there is no contentment. At every level in your life, tell, desire to be contented. It is the word of God. To be content. You see, when you are contented, that doesn't mean God is not going to elevate you. That doesn't mean that God is not going to take you higher. He is. Amen? But you are telling God, I am contented. Where? I am. I am contented where I am. And those people who walk in contentment, those are huyos. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So as we look at uh, how we are cultured by the word of God, somebody, <laughs> I don't know where you are, but somebody say, I'm a huyos. I have grown in the things of God. Yes, I don't compete. Oh my God, me, that's something I've never done in my life and I'm so happy. I have never competed with anyone. I celebrate you, but I have never wanted, I've, I've, I've never had. You see, the people who are in competitions are the ones who, who get into debt because they want to be like the neighbor. I've never desired to be like the neighbor. I've always desired to be like me. And where God has placed me, I am contented. I know God, that is what you have showed me. Before I get there, between here and there, I will not be stressed. Between here and there, I'll have an attitude of thanksgiving. Between here and there, I'm going to praise you. Between here and there, I'll still continue serving God. Raise the name of Jesus. Because you have become, you know people who are nepios, are even, they give God deadlines. Let me tell you God. Are you hearing me? God, if you don't come through for me, if I don't get a husband... By, the, by, the, by December 31st, if no human being wearing a trouser approaches me, God, I'm going to help myself. Yani, you are saying you, you are talking to the creator of the universe and you are giving him deadlines. Nepios. I think, God, if you don't come through for me, I'm going to sin. If you don't come through for me, God, I'm, I'm just going to get a man and I'm going to just get into his house and I'm just going to... So, God, you think that will change the position of God? You think God is going to stand up from his seat? No. He's still going to be seated. As you get yourself into a mess, he's still going to be... And the rest of us will be giving him a worship. Hey! Praise God. Thank you for the clap. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. The rest of us will still worship him. Yeah, as you give God deadlines. God, if you don't come. Kai, are you talking about God? That you're giving God deadlines. Who are you to give God deadlines? And the church was quiet. Hallelujah. Praise. I'm preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. So let's, let's look at how, now as you're talking about the culture of grace, the ordained order of God to us, for us to get to that place of huyos. Amen. So, uh, The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs 23 and verse 26. Because it is only truth. You, can, you cannot begin from another place. You can only begin from the place of truth. The Bible says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. This heart, he does not force it. You have to willingly give your heart. Amen? And when I say hearts, you know what I mean? I don't mean the red thing that pumps blood. I'm talking about give me your soul. 
Okay? Allow me to influence your soul. Allow me to culture your soul. Allow me to define what life is all about. Allow me to define you to yourself. Amen? And if you allow me to define you to you, the Bible says, then observe how I do things. Because you can never observe how God does things if you have not given him your heart. Amen. Because he's saying, when you give me your heart and you allow me to influence your heart, then your eyes will begin to see the product, the manifestation of you giving me your heart. But before you give God your heart, it is very hard for you to discern. It is very hard for you to know the ways of God. But when you give him your heart, the ways of God become evident. You can look at something and you say, this is, there is God in this one. You can look at something and say, there is God in this one. Because you become one with him. He has been able to influence how you think. He has been able to influence, how you, to influence you on how you, you process information. And you can get something that looks so good to others, but you, to you, you're like, uh-uh, this is not going to cut it. Why? Because you have given him your soul. You have allowed him to influence your mind, your will, and your emotions, so that in your daily walk, as you walk through life, you, you begin to see the ways of God. You're looking at that and you say, now that is the way of God. When you look at something else, you say, now that is not God's way. And you go and look at something else, you're like, uh-uh, that's not the way of God. Why? Because you have given God your heart. You have given, you have allowed him to influence how you think. But many people come to church, but they don't want to allow God to, uh, to influence how they think. They want God to work according to how they want him to work. But God is saying, no, you can never know my ways. You can never discern my ways. If you first, you have not allowed me as God to influence you. Because me as God, as I influence you, I'm imparting myself into you. So when a way is something is happening, you'll be able to know that is the way of God. So he's saying when you give it, you, with time you just begin to observe the ways of God. You begin to observe the ways of God in every aspect of your life. In your marriage. In your finances. Amen. In every aspect of your life. The Bible says that your eyes now will begin to observe the way God does things. Amen. You begin to observe. You see, now there is something that God can do, but to somebody who is not born of God, they may not observe it and say it is a way of God. But for somebody who has given God their heart, whose mind has been influenced by the word of God, they can be able to discern the ways of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Because something can look good, but it is not of God. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. So the Bible says, in the book of, uh, let's, hmm, let's look at the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 2 in the Amplified. This is Paul speaking. Because it only begins with truth, amen? Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. So many people think that worship is, Father, I worship you, Father, I honor you, Father, I give you praise, Father, I give you, and that is part of it. Are you understanding? But God is saying that is what he calls the act of worship. Okay? He's saying it is a logical, it is an intelligent act of worship when you present your bodies dedicating all not your mouth hallelujah dedicating all your so when i'm saying about dedicating all we are talking about your your body your soul and your spirit amen not head to do your body your soul and your spirit when all these are dedicated to god set apart like you're saying, nothing wicked comes in into my soul because you have set it apart for God. Amen. Because right now, the greatest attack that the devil has against the body of Christ is what we are seeing. You don't have to look for it very far. You just need to open your phone and you will see things that you are not supposed to be seeing. 
Okay? And the Bible is saying that you present your bodies, dedicating all yourself, set apart. You set yourself apart like somebody who is, somebody who is set apart to do something for God. Are you getting me? Yeah? Which is your logical, intelligent act of... So God is saying it is not intelligent. It is not logical. If the only thing you do on a Sunday morning is cry as they're leading us in praise and worship. But the rest of your being is not worshipping. God is saying, don't give me lip service. I want the whole of you. The whole of you is a smart, is an intelligent act of worship. So if you're just worshipping God on a Sunday morning, but your thought life, you have not structured it, you have, you're not feeding yourself, with the things of the spirit, if you're not feeding yourself with the things of God, if your body is not dedicated to God, God is saying your worship is not smart. Your, sm your worship is not intelligent. And people say, oh, I've been going to church. I've been worshiping. Oh, God is saying beyond what you tell me on a Sunday morning. Okay, I want to see what is it that goes through your mind when your mouth is not open. Where does your body lead you when nobody is seeing? God is saying the combination of the three is an intelligent act of worship. So worship is not really what we tell him on a Sunday morning. Worship encompasses everything that you are. That is an intelligent act of worship. Because you cannot worship God on Sunday. And then on Monday, you're watching pornography. Which God are we talking about? Your worship is not intelligent. And pastor told us on Friday that God cannot be mocked. You cannot, you, you cannot outsmart God. Like, God, you don't worry. I'm going to worship you on Sunday. God better be satisfied. I'm going to worship you until God hey, you won't. No one else is going to worship you in JCC Tikaro like me. I'm going to shout the loudest. I'm going to cry the most. God is saying, hmm, beyond that, what is it that you feed your mind with? What is it that you go? Where is it that you go with your feet? So you have not worshipped God if you have not worshipped God in those three ways. Raise the name of Jesus. So God calls it, it's an intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values, customs, but be transformed and progressively. So like Paul, he grew progressively, isn't it? Okay, because if somebody got born again yesterday, or last week, and they're still struggling with pornography today, it is understandable because he's progressively growing. Are you understanding? But being there, duh, you've been born again for five years, been born again for three years, and you're still struggling with pornography, uh, there's a problem. You have refused to grow. Because growth in Christ is not in, um, in the number of years you have attended church. It is, de it is determined by how smart your act of worship is. Because I say the act of worship is in three areas. Amen? So it's not in how long you've been in church, but coming to church for long is still good because you get an opportunity to be taught. Amen? Do not be, to, do not be conformed to this world. So when you're talking about the world, you're talking about the systems. Okay? Not, not to be conformed to the earth. We are all on the earth. Okay, but the Bible is telling us, do not be conformed to the systems of the world. And I said when I began that the culture that the devil introduced was a culture that had its basis in selfishness. Isn't it? So the Bible is telling us, do not be conformed to the systems of selfishness. Because anybody who steals from somebody is because they are selfish. Someone who steals from me is because they are. Yeah, can, do you, can you, most of the things that we do against each other have their basis on selfishness. 
Just look at it. You know, the, just imagine for one minute, the people that have hurt you, okay? If you look at the thing that they did, it had its basis on selfishness. So, and that is a culture that was introduced in the garden. That was the culture that was introduced by the enemy. So the Bible is saying us, do not, do not allow yourself to be conformed to the system of selfishness. Do not allow yourself to be conformed to the system of fear. Don't allow yourself to be conformed because those are the system of fear and selfishness. It gives birth to very many other things. Amen? Very many other, very many other things. Amen? Yeah, so the Bible continues to tell us any longer with its superficial values and customs. So you see the systems of the world. Like I said, the culture was introduced. The systems of the world, they have their own superficial values and customs. There's how it runs. It's a culture. There's how it runs. So God is saying, do not conform yourself to this. Because if you conform yourself to this, you are going to be destroyed with your born again spirits. You're going to be born again. But your life will not demonstrate somebody that is born again. Are you getting me, church? Because you have conformed. So the Bible is not saying there is a con- It's saying you yourself do not be conformed. Meaning you can choose to be conformed and you can choose not to be conformed. It's up to you. It's not up to God. Whether you are conformed to the, to the systems of the world has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with you. So it is your responsibility, not God's responsibility. Amen? Okay? So where was I? Okay. Ah, as you, where was I? But be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually. You have to allow yourself to you, you have to stop being, you have to move from being Nepios to Huyos. Amen? As you mature spiritually by the renewing of your, not by coming to church, because do you know you can come to church and not, your mind not be renewed? Because can I tell you after this service, if I was to stop 10 of you and ask you, what did I teach you? Some of you would encourage me and others would be like Jesus. I was just seeing a cute face. Guy, this one just brought their beautiful, handsome face. But everything that I said, Kumbe, the guy was in India. The man had traveled. The man was somewhere in Japan, but they are looking at you. Amen? So the Bible is saying that you have to allow your mind to be renewed. And what renews your mind? The word of God. Amen. The word of God and the Holy Spirit. Because they both have this. The Holy Spirit is the one who breathes the word. Isn't it? So when you begin to pray the word of God, there's a renewal that begins to happen. Praise the name of Jesus. And what is this? Focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. So the Bible continues to tell us, uh, by renewing your mind. And renewing your mind is something that you have to be purposeful about. That God, I'm renewing my mind. I'm renewing. And let me tell you, coming to church on Sunday morning is good. But by itself is not enough to renew your mind. What happens on ch- in church on Sunday morning, we, we whet your appetite. So that you can desire to go and study more. And learn more. So that your mind is renewed. Okay, so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is and what is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. So it's not going to, God is going to prove you as your mind is renewed. Okay, as your mind is renewed because it's renewed by the word of God. So there are things about God and about yourself that you'll begin to see as your mind is renewed. And you'll begin to prove to yourself, you're like, hey, yeah. I didn't know I can walk it up. I didn't know my life could turn out like this. Why? You're proving to yourself that renewing of the mind works. Because as, you re- as your mind is renewed, what you do also changes. The places you used to go, you don't go anymore. The things that you never used to do, you begin to do. Amen? And the things that you used to do that you stop doing. So, and as that happens, you begin, there's a change and there's a transformation in your physical life as you continue to live, as you continue to do the things that you need to do here on the earth for the glory of God. Amen? 
Praise the name of Jesus. So that is very important. It always begins with truth. And then after that, you have to begin to speak what you know. Amen? Because confession is a spiritual law. You will never go with your body where your mouth has never been. So you have to speak it for you to get there. So that's why it's good to renew your mind so that you can speak the things of God. Amen? So that your mouth can take you to the proper places. Isn't it? Your mouth will take you to the proper places because you have renewed your mind. Because your mind is renewed, even your, your, your language changes. Your prayer changes. The things you confess changes. Amen? Because the word of God has changed your desires. You know, the things that you used to desire before, you don't desire them anymore. The things that you'd fight about before, you don't fight them anymore. Then you're like, God, why was I ever even concerned about that? What you don't know is that your mind has been renewed. And when, you're, when your mind is renewed, you begin to birth some new desires. Amen? And as those new desires are birthed within you, this is when, where the Bible says, whatever you ask, you receive. Because now, as you're, as you're speaking, you're speaking the mind of God. Amen? Because the word of God is the mind of God. Are you getting me? Now, you're, you're speaking the word of God to God. Because your desires have been changed. So, if it is the desires of God for you, why would God not say yes? Amen? Because your desires have been changed. So every time you tell God, Father, I need this, God was like, I've been waiting for you to ask because this is a spiritual principle. Lazima ulize. You have to first ask as much as I want to give you as God. You have to ask. It's a spiritual law that I have laid down that you have to ask. So the things that you are asking are the things of God. They are the things of the Spirit. They don't have, they are not for selfish uh, ends. You know, they are for, 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 for good. Not only for you, but even for the people around you. So every time that you open your mouth and you express your desire before God, heaven has no choice but to say yes. Why? Because your desires are not off. Your desires are according to the word of God. The word of God has cultured you. Are you getting me? The word of God has cultured your desires. Now your desires have changed. Now you don't want a car to show people how blessed you are. You want a car because it's a means of transport. Amen? Now you want a car because it's a means of transport. You don't want a car so that when you go home for Christmas, you roll down the windows and then you put it on full volume. What are you They will know I arrived. They will know I... So my friend, now you will continue asking and nothing will happen. Because your desires have not been influenced by the word of God. But now if you tell God, Lord, I'm so tired of my tattoo. And this is not for show. I just want an easy way of moving from one place to another. Now that makes sense. Because God also would want it to happen. But if you are doing it to show us, my friend, rapture will happen before you show us. It will happen because before you show us, because the, 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 the ambitions, everything has its basis on the systems of the world. Amen? Has not been influenced by the word of God. Is somebody with me? Raise the name of Jesus. So when you pray, things happen because your, your, your desires have been influenced. You know, there are things that maybe, if you look back at your life, the time you got saved and now who you are, there are things that you used to desire, now you don't desire them anymore. And you would, it wouldn't mess your day if you didn't have them. Yeah, if you didn't have them, you, 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 it wouldn't mess your day. You, you're fine. And, and it's amazing, the more you grow in the things of God, the narrower the path becomes. The narrower there, you find that maybe when you got born again, you had many, 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 many friends. But now as you grow in the things of God, you, you love people, yes. Are you understanding? You're not hating on anybody, but those that you can call your friends now begin to become fewer and fewer and fewer because you're like, ah, we are not walking the same journey. Nothing, nothing on your side, but it's not working. 
Amen? So everything becomes narrower, narrower and narrower, even as time goes by. Because your attitudes, your values now have been influenced by the word of God. And not everybody has allowed themselves to be influenced by that. And you see now, if you get to, into, into relationship or fellowship with somebody, you're like, okay, let us, let us just belong to one church. Let us just be church members, loving each other, but I don't think I want to invite you into my inner circle because our values are different. Our values are different. But we are both born again, but our values are different. I have allowed the grace of God to culture me, and it's not going to be in vain in my life. It has taken me a minute. It has taken me a while for the grace of God to culture me, and uh, I, I'm not going to allow any mixture in my life. I'm going to love you. I'm going to be there if you have any issues. But I, I'm not going to invite you into my inner circle. Why? Because our values are different. I have allowed the word of God to culture me. And this is what it has made me. That has always been the desire of God when he gave us the gospel. So that the gospel can culture the church. So that the church can be a reflection of who Jesus is. Is. So that when you go to a place, you become the fragrance of Christ. You don't have to tell people you're born again. Your presence, are you understanding? How you, you, the way you do things tells everybody that you are born again. People don't get shocked when they hear that you are born again. You know there are places when you go and you say, I, I want to see sister somebody. They, sister who? <laughs> oh, she's your biological sister. You say no. She's my sister in Christ. Where? We didn't know. She's a sister. In, oh, so, okay, okay, okay. When I'm told that, I'm like, oh, Jesus, we have work. <laughs> Amen? Pray that you become a real sister in the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. So I think I'm going to end there because of time. Hallelujah. I had much more. Oh, I, I, was, I was prepared for you. Oh, 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 I was prepared for you because we have to allow the grace of God to culture us, to cultivate us. Amen. Yes, until we get to a place of manhood, until we get to a place of, uh, of, of growth where now God in heaven can say like that one is going to take care of issues. That one is going to occupy until I come. Because now, they have put away childish things. They don't allow those things to hinder them anymore. Every day they wake up, they're like, God, what do you want me to do today? He is your son, God. I, I can do all things. There is nothing that I cannot be able to do because, God, you have brought me to a place of growth. You have brought me to a place of maturity. And that is what the Bible calls walking in the spirit. The heroes are those men and women that walk in the spirit. Those are the heroes. But the nepios have a bit of the flesh to deal with. And let me tell you, church, because I'm done. See, I've closed. Most of the things that people are dealing with in church is not the devil. The devil left. He's very far. Most of the things that people are dealing with in church is the flesh. In the pious. Is the flesh. Even if you are to cast a demon, no demon would come out because there is no demon. It's purely the work of the. It's purely us not allowing ourselves to grow in the things of God. Many people have left church over the pious issues. I was not greeted. Oh, I met with Pastor Pauline. She didn't say hello. She's not a loving pastor. Let me ask you people. Is it possible for me to register all your beautiful faces in my head? So many times I go to town with a, when I'm going to town, which is very rare, I go with a ready smile. Hi. Hi. And I will start a conversation with you and finish. Because it is so embarrassing for me to ask you your name, and maybe you've been in Thicker Road for seven years. 
You're, you see, the way I know people is when you come to my office for whatever reason. You see, now that is one on one. So that way I'm able to register your face and I'm able to register your name. So when we meet in town, and maybe I am busy walking somewhere, you did, because you know me, I may not know you. And then you leave church, you're like, imagine I met with her in town. She didn't even say hi. And they talk about grace, they talk about love, the love of God. And I met with her in town, she didn't even say hello. I didn't say hello to you because I did not recognize you. Praise God. So many times I go to town with a ready smile. And then, <laughs> you see now, I came from Parklands. There are people who know me there, I don't know them. There are people in Thicker Road. They know me, I don't know them. So when I go to town, I go with a ready smile. And then after I go, <laughs> after we have spoken, so how are you? How is your family? Da, 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 da. The person I'm with, I'm like, you know, I don't know that person. <laughs> I hope you know I don't know their name. I hope I don't know, and I'm not lying because I can't know all your names. But there are people because of Nepios. They are like, Pastor did not say hello. Imagine she just passed. Shoo. She didn't say hello to me. She didn't say hello to me. Sorry. I'm so sorry because maybe you felt like that, but it's because I did not recognize your, I did not recognize your face. But as a church of Jesus Christ, we need to get to a place of maturity and allow the grace of God to cultivate us to a place where God looks at us and is like, wow, those ones, they not, they not only have Christ, but they display Christ wherever they go in the name of Jesus. I am done. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs>